My name is Bond. 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 James Bond. You recovered it. We've lost one of our nuclear submarines. She was equipped with ATAC. The world microchip market. The death of 007. You have a nasty habit of surviving. <laughs> you missed Mr. Bond. Did I? With Lazenby and Connery out of the picture, Connery refused the then unheard of sum of five and a half million dollars to return. It was time for a new James Bond. While again many candidates were considered, including Jeremy Brett and Timothy Dalton, while well, United Artists wanted an American for the role, so Burt Reynolds, Paul Newman, and Robert Redford's names were brought up, the part eventually went to Roger Moore, an already established star, most notably for his title role in the television series The Saint. With Roger Moore taking over the 007 duties, it began a cycle of subsequent generations of film audiences being given their own James Bond. This would also start the never-ending debate on the ranking of who was the best and the worst in the role. Moore's tenure was the longest. He would play Bond for the next 12 years. He would also play the part the most times, seven. Connery did six, but if you count the unofficial Bond film Never Say Never Again, he ties with Moore. Moore was 46 at the time of his first Bond film, Live and Let Die. Considering that Connery was 41 when he last departed the role in Diamonds Are Forever, you have to wonder how long filmmakers expected Roger Moore to play the role. But despite his age, Moore looks much younger in his earlier Bond films. His first two Bond films are ones I have never been crazy about. In fact, they probably rank as the two I go back least to rewatch from the first half of the series. His first film combined the comical with the mystical. Bond sets out to take down the mysterious Mr. Big, who's also Dr. Kananga. Along the way, he takes on his metal-hooked henchman, Teehee, Kananga's mystical sidekick, and Solitaire, his personal psychic. It feels like Moore and the filmmakers were trying to find who Moore's Bond was. They intentionally tried to distance Moore's Bond from Connery's. No visit to M's office. M and Moneypenny visit Bond at his home, where of course he's got a chick stashed away, and there's no appearance by Q. Moore does the funny quips, something he's always good at, but the supernatural theme of the film seems out of place in Bond's world. Watching the film now, it looks like the filmmakers were trying to jump on the bandwagon with the popularity of black exploitation films at the time, and it's badly dated the film. It is kind of funny to see 007 walk into a bar in 1970s Harlem and be called a honky though. The story itself is not very engaging, it sometimes feels like a Scooby-Doo adventure, and the action is either mundane or gets over long. The boat chase, which is the big action set piece of the film, starts out as fun, but goes on way too long and just gets tiring to watch. The entire film feels claustrophobic and looks cheap. It doesn't have the epic scale that you would come to expect from a Bond film. Mr. Big's disguise is pretty laughable and it doesn't seem possible that anyone would be fooled by it. And the comedy relief by Sheriff Pepper is just eye-rolling. Bond purists have a field day bashing on the character. There is some good. Jane Seymour as Solitaire is hot and makes the character one of the more memorable Bond girls. Yafe Koto is decent as Kananga. It's always nice to see a villain who looks like he could actually take Bond on in a fight. The theme song by Paul McCartney is one of the best Bond songs. And it's also worth noting David Hedison's appearance as Felix Slater, the first actor who will eventually reprise the role 16 years later. Live and Let Die was immediately followed by The Man with the Golden Gun a year later. This time around, Bond has to face off in a duel with the assassin Scaramanga. Along the way, he gets to wear a third nipple, fight Nick Knack, Scaramanga's midget sidekick, and share some screen time with Sheriff Pepper again, who happens to be on vacation in Thailand. 
This film, I don't know. This film is just disappointing. The basic plot of Bond going up against his evil counterpart sounds like it would result in an entertaining film, but it just fails on almost every level. To star, Christopher Lee is fine as Scaramanga. He exudes the charm and charisma that suits the character. Plus, he seems like a man who could take down 007. His big scheme of stealing solar energy machines or whatever is boring, and they probably should have just stuck with the assassination of Bond. It's much more intriguing. Maud Adams is very hot as Scaramanga's sex slave, Andrea, and we see something not very often from Moore's Bond when he slaps her around to get information. Moore, of course, has some funny one-liners. Says, speak I'll forever hold your peace. While Britt Eklund looks great walking around in her bikini, her character is pretty inept and clumsy. She gets locked in the trunk of a car that sprouts wings and flies away. And the scene of her hiding under the sheets while Bond talks with Andrea, then hides in the closet while they go at it, looks like something you would see in an episode of Three's Company. Bond having to fight off Hervé Villachez and locking him in a suitcase is pretty silly. I was actually rooting more for Hervé in that scene. The action is pretty ho-hum. The climax in the funhouse set is pretty dull. Veteran moviegoers should be able to predict how the duel will end just by watching the opening teaser. A short boat chase that starts with Bond requiring the assistance of a boy to turn on his motorboat is greeted by some wisecracks by Sheriff Pepper before he's pushed in the canal by an elephant. Pepper is along for the ride and the car chase too. Did this character really make such an impression on audiences that they needed to bring him back? The car chase is routine only highlighted by the unique corkscrew jump. 